Chapter 12 When the village boys, who were laying in wait for me in the forest, caught me at last, I expected something terrible to happen to me. Instead, I was taken to the head of the village. He made certain that I had no sores or ulcers of my body, and I could make a sign of the cross. Then, after several unsuccessful attempts to place me with other peasants, he handed me over to a farmer called Maker. Maker lived with his son and daughter on a farmstead set apart from the rest of the settlement. Apparently, his wife had died long ago. He himself was not well known in the village. He had arrived only a few years before and was treated as a stranger, but rumors circulated that he avoided other people because he sinned both with, his, with the boy he called his son and with the girl he called his daughter. Maker was short and stocky, and had a thick neck. He suspected I only pretended to be mute, to avoid betraying my gypsy speech. Sometimes at night he would rush into the tiny attic in which I slept, and try to force a scream of fear from me. I would awake shaking, and open my mouth like a baby chick wanting to be fed. But no sound came out. He watched me intently, and seemed disappointed. After repeating the test from time to time, he eventually gave up. His son, Anton, was twelve years old. He was a redhead with pale eyes and no eyelashes. He was shunned in the village as much as his father. When someone spoke to him, he would glance indifferently at the speaker and then turn silently away. They called him the quail because he was like that bird in the habit of speaking only to himself and never answering other voices. There was also the daughter, Uka, a year younger than the quail. She was tall and blonde and thin with breasts like unripe pears and hips that allowed her to squeeze easily between the staves of the fence. Uka never went to the village either. When Maker went with quail to, to sell rabbits and rabbit skins in the neighboring villages, she remained alone. She was visited occasionally by Anuka, the local purveyor of curses. Uka was not popular in the village. The peasants said she had a ram in her eyes. They laughed at the goiter, which was beginning to disfigure her neck and at her hoarse voice they said that the cows lost their milk in her presence and that is why maker kept only rabbits and goats i often heard peasants mutter that maker's strange family should be turned out of the village and his house burned down but maker did not listen to such threats he always carried a long knife in his sleeve and he could throw it with such perfect aim that he once pinned a cockroach to a wall at five paces. And Quail always kept a hand grenade in his pocket. He had found it on a dead partisan, and it was always threatening the person and family of anyone who bothered him or his father or sister. Maker kept trained wolfhound, which he called Ditko, in the backyard. There were the rabbit cages arranged in the rows of the outbuildings surrounding the yard. Only wire netting separated the cages from one another. The rabbits sniffed and communicated while Maker could watch them all at one glance. Maker was a rabbit expert. In his cages he had many splendid specimens, too costly for even the wealthiest farmers. At the farm he had four she-goats and a male goat. The, qu the quail looked after them, milked them, took them out of their pasture, and sometimes locked himself up with one of them in the stable. When Maker came home after a successful sale, both he and his son would get drunk and go to the goat's quarters. Uka used to hint maliciously that they were enjoying themselves in there. At such times, Ditko was tied close to the door to prevent anyone from approaching. Uka did not like her brother and father, 
Sometimes she would not leave the house for days, fearing that Maker and Quail would force her to spend the whole afternoon with them in the goat stable. Uka liked to have me around when she was cooking. I helped to peel the vegetables, brought firewood, and carried out the ashes. Sometimes she asked me to sit close to her legs and kiss them. I used to cling to her slim calves and start kissing them very slowly from the ankles, first with a light touch of the lips and gentle strokes of the hand along the top muscles, kissing the soft hollow under her knee up into the smooth white thigh. I gradually lifted her skirt. I was urged on by light taps on my back and hastened upward kissing and half biting the tender flesh. When I reached the warm mound, Uka's body began to shake uncontrollably. She ran her fingers wildly through my hair, caressed my neck and pinched my ears, panting faster and faster. Then she pressed my face hard against herself, and after a moment of trance fell back on the bench, all spent. I also liked what followed next. Uka sat on the bench, holding me between her open legs, hugging and caressing me, kissing me on the neck and face. Her dry, heather-like hair fell over my face as I looked into her pale eyes and saw a scarlet blush spread from her face to her neck and shoulders. My hands and mouth revived again. Uka began to tremble and breathe deeper. Her mouth turned cold and her shaking hands pressed me to her body. When we heard the men coming, Uka would rush to the kitchen, fixing her hair and skirt, while I ran to the rabbit hutches for the evening feedings. Later, after Makar and his son had gone to sleep, she brought me my meal. I ate it quickly, while she lay down naked by my side, eagerly stroking my legs, kissing my hair, hastily removing my clothes. We would lie together, and Uka would press her body tightly to mine, asking me to kiss and suck her, now here, now there. I followed all of her wishes, doing all kinds of things, even if they were painful or meaningless. Uka's motions became spasms. She twitched under me, then scrambled up on top, then made me sit on her, grasp me eagerly between her legs, dug her nails into my back and shoulders. We spent most of the nights like this, dozing off from time to time and waking again to yield to her seething emotions. Her whole body seemed to be tormented by mysterious internal eruptions and tensions. It grew taut like a rabbit skin stretched on a board to dry, and then it relaxed again. At times, Uka would come to me at the rabbit huts in the daytime, when Quail was alone with the goats and Maker had not yet returned home. We jumped over the fence together and disappeared at the high-growing wheat. Uka led the way to choose a safe hiding place. We would lie down on the stubby ground, where Uka urged me to undress faster and tugged impatiently at my clothes. I sank into her and tried to satisfy all her different whims, while the heavy ears of wheat moved over us like the swells of a tranquil sea. Uka would fall asleep for a few moments. I scanned this golden ocean of wheat, noticing the blue bottles timidly hovering in the sun's rays. Higher up the swallows promised a good weather with their intricate gyrations. Butterflies circled in the carefully, carefree pursuit, and a lonely hawk hung high in the sky like an eternal warning, waiting for some unsuspecting pigeon. I felt secure and happy. Uka moved in her nap. Her hand sought me instinctively, and it bent the wheat stalks on its way to me. I crawled over to her and worked my way between her legs and kissed her. Uka tried to make me become a man. She would visit me at night and tickle my parts 
painfully pushing in the thin straw, squeezing, licking. I was surprised to perceive something I had not known before. Things over which I had no control began to happen. It was still spasmodic and unpredictable, sometimes rapid, sometimes slow, but I knew I could not stop the feeling any more. When Uka fell asleep at my side, muttering through her dreams, I pondered all these things, listening to the sounds of the rabbits around us. There was nothing I would not do for Uka. I forgot my fate as a gypsy mute destined for fire. I ceased to be a goblin jeered at by shepherds, casting spells on children and animals. In my dreams I turned into a tall, handsome man, fair-skinned, blue-eyed, with hair like pale autumn leaves. I became a German officer, in a tight black uniform. Or I turned into a bird-catcher, familiar with all the secret paths of the woods and marshes.